Carla Starr. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. So you wrote a book, Can You Learn to Be More Lucky? I'm curious, what got you thinking about luck? Was there an event in your life where you're like, I need to look more into this? Yes, it was 10 years ago. I was living in Buenos Aires for a few years, and then I moved back to the States, to Portland, Oregon, right around the height of the Great Recession. And it just seemed like there was so much randomness and chaos everywhere around me, like, you know, who was unemployed, what was going on. So I just wanted to study the one underlying thing that would help me improve as many aspects of my life and help me kind of wrap my head around what was going on. So when you talk about luck, how do you, how are you defining luck in your book? People say that something is due to luck when we say that it's caused by something that's external, unpredictable, or outside of our control. So this might be the case. Maybe we lost the game because the ref made a bad call or we didn't get a part because the director didn't like our shirt. But the problem is that people usually make this shift from, I can do something about this to, oh, it's out of my hands way too early. And this is partly because our brains are fundamentally lazy, right? We're always looking for a shortcut and it's easier to just change our goal and say, oh, that's good enough than it is to try harder. But this is also really to save our ego. So if we think that we lost the game because of this bad call, we can still tell ourselves like, no, we're really better. It was just, that's a bad thing that happened. So in other words, when people start blaming luck, they're making this shift from, you know, I can do something, this is an internal cause to an external cause, which means that they're giving up personal responsibility and really making an excuse. So overall, while it does make sense to say that luck exists, the more often we blame it, the less motivated we are to examine our contribution or our part in how things happened. And overall, that leads to worse outcomes. It takes more energy to see your part in change but there's always something you can do. So when you say, can we learn to be lucky? What does that mean? So if they're at, these things are outside of control, do we have more control than we think we do? Absolutely. I think that, I mean, that's one of the huge things. Um, like one of the huge themes in the book is that people's just their overall like life goals and the way that we manage to accomplish our things that we set out to do. Um, there's pretty much a direct correlation between how much control we think we have and whether or not people actually accomplish their objectives. And part of that is because the whole idea of thinking that we can control things, like, you know, we become more likely to persist. We become more likely to, you know, look at our part in things. And, you know, there's always something we can do, even if it's just trying again. So I think the other part of it is that luck is essentially just when everything goes right. I think that people underlook this idea because, you know, for the most part, things go pretty well. We don't always appreciate that. So it's, also just kind of being able to capitalize on like just the randomness and be open to things. So there are a lot of different ways to conceptualize it, which is one of the reasons that can be a little tricky, but overall, you know, knowing that we can control things or knowing that, you know, there's something we can do about it. That's really adaptive because the second that we think something is uncontrollable, that actually makes it stressful and that actually reduces our motivation to even work on something. So the idea is it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If, th- if you think things are going to go your way and you take action to make things go your way, things that you otherwise would have attributed to luck if things didn't go your way, you can say, well, no, I can actually do this and I actually can influence that more than I than most people think. Yes, 100%. There's another theme in the book is this idea of positive illusions. So people think like cognitive biases are all bad. You know, they're all just these weird shortcuts that our brain takes. But there's actually one family of cognitive biases that's completely adaptive and that's called positive illusions. So that's things like optimism and confidence. And these are all completely adaptive and lead to better life outcomes to the extent that they promote goal-directed action. So if you think... I can, you know, work really hard and make my dream come true. Then guess what? You're going to work hard and your dreams are more le- likely to come true. And I think another thing we'll we'll delve deeper in here when we talk about specific things that you can do to, you know, get more lucky or get luckier is that there are things that people would otherwise attribute to luck or are actually attributable to luck, right? Like timing or things like that, but like you show ways that you can influence that in your direction. Right. Right. So like timing, you know, that's something that, you know, Generally, it's out of our control, but I think once you kind of look at the other side of the coin and you look at people's decision-making process and you kind of understand, like, you know, why it is that they're more likely to, you know, to do something at a certain time, 
I think that can just, you know, really help us understand like the mechanisms and that can, you know, help us hack it. Yeah. I think what you're trying to do is increase. So like, there's always a continuum of like skill and luck or randomness. What you're trying to do is increase that, the, the luck or the, the, you're trying to increase the skill part of it. Right. And reduce luck. Yes. 100%. Like I have this spectrum that I use when I give talks sometimes and, you know, people look at, you know, think of luck, they might just think of like, oh, it's a slot machine, right? Like, that's kind of what life is. Like, you just go up to it and you press a little button and like, you know, whatever happens, happens. And, you know, really a much better metaphor for life or all these things is like poker. Like, you don't necessarily have control over the cards that you're dealt. However, you know, poker, like, there are skills that you can learn and become a better poker player. So regardless of the hand you were actually dealt, we can learn how to play it better. Right. So this is what this book kind of gets at. It, it, it's, it's recognizing that luck does play a role, but there are places or things we can do where we can influence things a bit more. So let's get into the specifics. I thought it was really interesting. Let's talk about some of the specificness of that. So let's talk about, well, first this, before we get into specific, like what do you think is the overarching principle of all these ideas you highlight in the book where we can tilt luck more into our favor? I think negative unpredictable things or random things have a predictably self-defeating influence on our behavior. So pretty much the brain is lazy. We are lazy. We are, you know, always motivated to do less whenever we can. So if we think that it's not worth it to try a little harder, we won't try a little harder. And then we prove ourselves right. So overall, I think, you know, motivate, motivation, motivation to persist, motivation to get better, you know, confidence, like social skills, like, pretty much is entirely contingent on motivation. So let's talk about uh, how timing can influence the outcomes of, you know, whether we get a job, whether we win a contest, like take like a job. We think, well, I got the job because I had the resume. I impressed the people in the interview. I've got the skills, but you highlight research that sometimes that's not the case. Just sometimes you get the job because you showed up at a certain time during the day when they were doing interviews. 100%. 100%. It could be the time of day you showed up at. It could be, you know, oh, you happen to wear a green tie, you know, and the person who had this job that you're interviewing for used to wear green ties all the time and he was kind of a jerk, you know, so you subconsciously remind the interviewer of that person. So there are all these like very small things that can influence your chances of success in one way or another that have absolutely nothing to do with your merit as an applicant. Well, and I, you've also highlighted a lot of research showing that, you know, you, did, you talked about the Westminster Dog Show as an example, or ta- even a tattoo contest. And what you found was, or what the researchers have found is that the people who last in the contest, you know, to be judged, they typically win. Like what's going on there? Why do those people typically win? So if you think about what happens when we look at, say, a series of things over the course of the night, if you're looking at like an Olympic contest, the first thing you see what you're really doing is you're grading those against the ideals that are in your head. You know, you're kind of going to be a little more critical of them and you're always going to leave a little room at the top because you never really know what else is going to go there. However, what happens as you go along and as you see more performances or more tattoos, the context in which you are evaluating things shifts. So what you're doing as you go along further the night is you're not comparing them to the ideals in your head, but you're comparing them implicitly, even though you don't realize this, you're comparing them to the other things you've already seen. So by the time you get to the last, you know, tattoo or song or whatever, you're able to point out the unique qualities that that thing has that nothing else, you know, you've seen before has. And then you're also able to just say like, wow, this is the best, you know, that was the best jump we've seen throughout the night. Whereas the first performance you saw, you were not able to say, wow, this is the only performance we will see where this person executed that jump perfectly. No, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And the other thing going to, you know, going for you if you go last is like they remember you more because you're the last thing they saw. Absolutely. So they mistake the vividness of their memory as a sort of, you know, idea of like the quality of how, you know, how good it was. Right. So you think, oh well, if it was really good, it would be, you know, really memorable. It would be really vivid when actually it's just timing and the recency effect. So in the the case of something like a job interview, luck might determine when you have the interview. So the the timing component is out of your hands. Despite that, what can you do to help influence the outcome? Well, one thing I think is, um, is really robust is to just try to remind other people of the ways that you remind or the things that you have in common with other people who have succeeded in that position beforehand. 
you know, so you kind of, what you want to do is you want to make it as easy as possible for other people to see you in that position, regardless of where you go. Gotcha. So yeah. And I, I, so if you don't, if you can't influence whether you're, you know, the first or the last one to go, if you're the first one, you try to be as memorable as possible by doing something like you just said, or even just, yeah, being memorable. Right. And I think also, you know, the timing throughout the day can be kind of tricky because you might have your interview, you know, right at the end of the day or right at the beginning of the day. However, once it really depends on when that person has decided and we're not always privy to that information, you know, they might decide, you know, at the end of the day on Tuesday. So then, you know, it doesn't matter when you go on Wednesday, they've already kind of made up their mind. So, yeah. And in that case, you know, so I think this is useful to know because you might have all the credentials, you might have what it takes to do the job. You don't get it. And it might not because it might just because you just, you interviewed at the wrong time and that's it. And you shouldn't feel, get too down on yourself. Absolutely. And I hear this from people all the time, you know, oh, I really wanted to switch careers and, you know, get into this line of work, but I applied and they didn't take me, you know, but that is one data point. And I can say, you know, after researching all these things for 10 years, like just fundamentally, this book has made me so much more resilient and just so much more optimistic because when you realize like how obscure or how random some of these, the things that influence people's decision-making process can be, you'll realize like, no, it's not always about you. So let's talk about more into this, this decision-making process that, you know, we think is luck, but we can actually influence it a bit. So when we go to a job interview or we, you know, apply for a job, we think the decision maker is being super rational. They're looking right at the, our credentials and they're making this analytical choice because they say, well, we need XX for the job and this person has XX, so we're going to hire them. But you make the case that, no, that's not how we really make decisions. Humans often make decisions in their gut first. And then after the fact, they come up with the the rational reasons. Well, I, I, I remember talking to Michael Mosenbaum. He wrote the book about success and luck and talent and luck. And he gave this example that going in place for it. And his, and his real life example was he went to go in, interview for this job. There's a lot of competition. And he happened to see that the interviewer had like a, a Washington Redskins trash can. Mm-hmm. And he just said, oh, I love the Washington Redskins too. And they had this talk about Washington Redskins. And like, like nothing came up about his credentials, but he still got the job. And it was just one of those cases, like he lucked out. <laughs> this guy was also a Washington Redskins fan and he got the job because of it. Oh, uh, yeah, that happens all the time. Well, so what do you do if you're applying for a job and you you know this is happening, that people are making decisions with their gut first? Because they, they might see you and they like, okay, like you said, they remind, you remind that person of like their ex or their crazy uncle. And immediately they're like, no, that's this guy. We're not hiring this guy. But like, what can you do knowing that that's happening to kind of tilt luck more towards your favor? So I think it's important to remember that it's fundamentally this process of us gathering information and then sort of like weighing the costs and benefits of the pros and cons. So it's really important to remember that the first piece of information or the initial pieces of information that people get about you are the most informative and they kind of end up skewing how people filter the rest of the information they get about you. And that is why it is so, so much easier to get a job through connections because then it's, oh, well, you know, Dan recommended this person, therefore, you know, Dan's a good guy. Therefore, we're going to look at the rest of this person's application or resume through that positive lens. Or, oh, this person came recommended to us through this agency or through this, you know, common LinkedIn connection. Or, oh, we saw this person, you know, this one project that they did that really stood out. So they're going to look at everything else in a really positive light. All right. So build that network up. Build that network. Yeah. It's huge. And then also just, you know, whatever you can do to not just be one in the pile. Right. Another thing that can influence whether, I mean, it's sort of this sort of a continuation of what we just been talking about is like so if someone just likes you, they're more likely to you know pick you for a job, accept your pitch, go on a date with you. But what's interesting, you highlight research that sometimes what causes people to like us is that they just see us a lot. And it's not that for I me, mean, that first impression has a big sway, uh, can can influence things for a long term. But it, over time, if that person sees you over and over again, they start liking you and they're more willing to go with you if they have to make a decision that involves you. Absolutely. So it's the called the mere exposure effect. So the whole idea is that mere exposure or simple exposure can make us like somebody more over time because we get a chance to constantly see that person. And then it's just essentially a learning process where we're learning to associate this one person with nothing bad happening. So in evolution, it's this idea that whatever is familiar hasn't eaten you yet. 
So the more you see somebody, the more safe they appear, the less risky they appear. And then also you just have more opportunities to collect information and find, you know, good information about somebody. But this is also really, it's a good example of why it's so important or why first impressions are so key. Because if the first impression that someone gets about you or the first interaction that someone has with you is negative, then what are they going to do? Well, they're just going to assume, wow, this person is a jerk. And then they're going to filter you and the rest of your actions through that lens. So usually like seeing someone over and over, it usually is positive because, you know, we repeat actions or we repeat interactions if they are positive and we're pretty much for the most part, like fundamentally motivated to maintain good relationships with the people we see. And does this like, so this is a proximity effect. Does it like have to be like, you have to be physical, physically close, like in like the same, like see this person physically, like meet space, we'll call it for this effect to happen. Or can this happen online as well? Well, it's definitely physically is just it's safer because we get context, you know, things are interactive, you know, kind of are more motivated to have like you know, positive impressions in person. Whereas if somebody just sees you online, you know, I think social media is it's especially really kind of dangerous for this because people are, we're always just putting up these, you know, very filtered kind of curated impressions of ourselves. So there's this whole idea of the ideal self, whereas we'll like people and we're even willing to like people if we think they're maybe a little better than us. But if we feel that they're kind of like, they've exceeded that, you know, maybe if they're like showboating or something, that's when jealousy can get involved. And I think that's one of the reasons why social media can be so tricky because we don't really see the whole, the nuance or the context, you know, we don't realize like, oh, this is just this, you know, this one awesome moment in this person's month. And we should be happy for them that they are on this awesome trip because, you know, other awful things happen to them. (laughs) Right. Um, So what can we do? Like knowing that, okay, if we, if, the mere exposure effect uh, plays a role in whether people like us or not. Like, what can we do? Say if you're looking for a job or, I mean, this could like also work in your romantic life as well. Absolutely. I mean, I think this is, so this is actually one of the interesting things that I've you know also uncovered in the research is I think that people really overemphasize the impact of luck or the impact of these one, you know, this one interaction or this one thing that led to this host of other things and really like personality traits or, character strengths that we can develop are really predictive of overall life outcomes because it's not just that one thing it's oh this person you know made a hundred contacts and it happened to be that one that ended up paying off you know or oh this person is involved in that many social groups and they have this large of a social network you know and that is how they're able to like you know finally meet the person who ended up you know becoming their significant other all right. So yeah, the takeaway, get out there, mix it up with people in real, real life. Yeah. And that was actually this one thing that this relationship researcher told me, he said that, you know, people, you know, they think about like online dating and it's, it's really just a numbers game and <laughs> that can make people become, you know, a little jaded. And when in fact, most successful long-term relationships happen between people who have already known each other for a long time. Yeah. We had him on the podcast and he talked about his research. That was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Like most people who they end up with, uh, who they end up marrying or whatever, like they worked with them or they were a friend for years, as opposed to they just found each other on Tinder or whatever. Yes, by far. Absolutely. Because you get, you know, it's the whole fact finding thing. You just are able to collect more information about the person and then, you know, it's just, you get to know somebody before you decide, should you be in a relationship with them or not? As opposed to just, you know, (laughs) is their face cute? And that, uh, you know, and physical appearance, you know, it is important to be attracted to somebody, but there's this huge personality effect on how attractive we find somebody. So over time, as you get to know somebody, you know, personality is definitely what can change a seven to a 10 or a seven to a three. No, yeah, you highlight, he did some, you talked about research where, yeah, they they had students in a classroom rate each other like physical and like attractiveness at the beginning of the semester, and you know the 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 ratings were what you'd expect like you know the objectively attractive people were nines and tens or whatever. But at the end of the year, the end of the semester, they did the the rating again, and who was ranked you know the most physically? It was like all over the place. There was like no because people got to know each other and some personalities clicked and they found that personality more attractive and that influenced, you know, they, they, 
they brought that in as a factor into the physical attractiveness. Absolutely. So it's just kind of like you're, you know, is this person a 10 or not? Well, that depends on how much information you have about them. So when you first meet somebody, the only information you have about them is their physical appearance. But when you kind of get to know and see somebody and all their complexity, you know, that one number actually has so many more variables behind it. Well, let's, let's kind of continue that thread of physical attractiveness because you, you talk about this in the research that you know, people who are physically attractive tend to have a pretty great life. <laughs> so, I mean, talk about like, so it's not only just being physically attractive and like people see you and they like you because you're physically attractive, but like it also sort of like greases the wheels for pretty much the rest of their life and all facets of their life. Talk about that a little bit. I Honestly, I ended up just researching this for months and months because I was like, what? This really can't happen. This can't be true. But life is so much easier for physically attractive people in so many aspects. Like, you know, when they get arrested or when they're on trial, they're more likely to be found not guilty. They're more likely to be given lighter sentences. And the only case that they're actually penalized in the legal system is when the juries figure that they use their appearance as a weapon. So it's in, in cases of like fraud, for example. But just fundamentally, you know, physically attractive people have better genes. So we're more like just from an evolutionary standpoint, we're more motivated to bond with them. You know, they seem to be like free of pathogens and that influences like how much money we give them in these economic trust games that influences just social interactions in general, because, you know, just imagine like everybody is always coming up to you and they're always being super nice to you. And so you just, over time, you feel like you have a larger sense of social support and your self-esteem is kind of, you know, tends to be higher and you just you really get graded on a curve for everything for your entire life. I mean, even, you know, students grade or teachers give students higher grades on essays when they, they're attractive students. So it's all these things that you would not really even expect or, you know, like, why would a teacher give a cute kid a higher grade? That kind of seems weird. But that actually happens. No, I thought the really interesting point that I didn't never thought about is if you're physically attracted, as you said, people just are nice to you. They're they're more willing to cut you a break and whatever. But like that will influence how you interact with the world. You go out in the world with this like sort of optimistic bias that the you know this person's a friend. He's going to be a friend of mine. I don't the the universe is going to you know work for me. As opposed, to if you didn't have that going for you, where you have to like you're always looking for threats and people like treating you like garbage. Like if you have that. At, if you've lived with that your entire life, like that can be a big boon to you. Oh, it's huge. Like I, I feel like, you know, just personally, the more physically attractive people I know are also the ones who, you know, they're, they take more risks. They'll, you know, go on these trips, they'll move somewhere and they'll pursue their dreams. Why? Because they know that if they kind of get, you know, they get all this stuff together and they pack up and they move to the other side of the country, it'll be that much easier for them to make friends and have a new social group. And so it's just kind of like wherever they go, like, you know, there's going to be a safety net for them. And they just have that much more of a, a robust sense of that, you know, whereas opposed to people who are, you know, they're in their hometown, they're like, oh, you know what, why bother? It's just that much harder. And it's, it's so it's one of those things. It's, you know, they are lucky, you know, physically attractive people are lucky because they get, you know, this good, good social stuff coming to them all the time. However, what that does is that ends up influencing what they bring to the table, right? So they're going to be a little friendlier. They're going to be a little outgoing. So that is what they're bringing to the table. However, they're bringing that to the table because of this like more positive history of experiences. All right. So physical attractiveness, that's like pure randomness, right? That's just genes. Your, whether you the parents you had and how the genes interacted with each other to make you. So like, what do you do like if you got the short end of the physical attractiveness stick? Well, interestingly enough, I'm glad you brought this up. 50% of how we tend to rate other people in physical attractiveness is this component called grooming. So I don't know if you've ever like Googled, Googled or looked up, um, you know, oh, if celebrities were like us. And they have these pictures of um, things like Beyonce and Jay-Z, and they're wearing these like just hideous clothes, and they're a little bit chubby, and their hair is kind of gross. You know, it's kind of like what, you know, or like what Britney Spears or, you know, Cameron Diaz would look like if they were in the Midwest. And it is really funny. It's like, oh, they have the same face, but it's just the rest of them. You know, it's not just their face, but it's like what they're doing with the rest of it. So like, are they in good shape? Well, what kind of clothes are they wearing? What, what is their hair like? Are they well-groomed? So there is a lot you can do with that. And I think that's another one of those things where it's kind of like the Matthew effect, like the rich get richer. I think that people who 
have a more positive history of being told like, oh, you're attractive. They're more willing to kind of make the most of what they have. Whereas other people who maybe are a little more self-conscious about their appearance figure like, oh, why bother? You know, so they won't go to the gym. They won't, you know, put any thought into what they're wearing. And people, you know, whether or not we'd like to admit it, we're all kind of shallow and we're all making these snap decisions about other people. So yeah, easy. Just shower, shave, go to the, go to the gym. Like that's stuff you can do. That's stuff you can do. Absolutely. And I think, so I, I went shopping with a, a personal stylist and I spent some time with this, this woman who's like a, you know, social coach. And so I actually started paying a little more attention to my clothes and my parents. And I am absolutely, I continue to be dumbfounded in how much easier that makes social interactions and how much better people treat me. I think like, it's, if you're looking for like, you know, quick and easy way to just make your life better, like by far that has the best ratio of cost and benefits of anything I've done. So another aspect of whether people get more lucky in life is if they just have this attitude that things are going to work their way. They have confidence. And a lot of people think that, you know, you either have confidence or you don't, you're born with it or you're not. But you, you highlight research. No, that's not the case. You can actually develop your confidence. Oh, absolutely. You can develop your confidence in any aspect of your life. I think confidence is really us knowing that, you know what, things will be okay if if they don't work out, things will not go to hell in a handbasket. And I think it's a lot of it has to do with attention. So it's just how much attention do we give the potential rewards or how much attention do we pay to our, our mistakes? So I notice now like, you know, people who are really confident, someone who's really confident in that say someone who's kind of anxious or insecure they can go and do the same thing, right? So say maybe they'll go up to someone they're attracted to and they'll, you know, ask them out on a date, you know, and the person who is kind of more confident, they'll be like, oh, if you say no, like, okay, you know, thanks, but they won't crumble. You know, they won't kind of ruminate. They won't obsess over it. They will realize that that is not an, any sort of like objective statement about their self-worth. Whereas someone who's kind of insecure, they might ruminate and get down on it and then like obsess over that negative thing forever. So a confident person has like that approach attitude towards rewards, whereas like unconfident, they have like a avoidance, like they're uh, unconfident people. They, they fear the downsides more than they, f- than they are going after the rewards. Whereas confident people focus more on the rewards. Right. So less confident people, they have a, a more active, what is called a behavioral inhibition system, which is like essentially just our brain kind of putting the brakes on our behavior. Whereas confident people, you know, they're all about like approaching rewards and like not really letting other things get in their way. And so often if you look at it, it really is just us getting our, in our own way. You know, it's our, our attitude or our anxieties or our obsession over oh, this bad thing is going to happen. And we're so sure of it. No, but that, that's another place where luck does play a role a little bit is our temperament is also determined by genetics. Often case, you know, neurotic people are neurotic often because they got neurotic parents or neurotic grandparents. Mm-hmm. So, but even though that's the case, there's still wiggle room for you to, to shape that though. Absolutely. I think that's like one of the really cool things, you know, that I studied is that, you know, whenever we're talking about like, oh, is it, is it genes or is it something that we can learn? You know, and those questions, the answer is really both, you know, it's always both. So it's maybe you do have like the genes that make you, you know, learn from mistakes more easily than rewards, which is actually, you know, a potential thing because of all these different um, variabilities in our dopamine receptors. But it really is just attention and how much attention we pay to, to things. So people who might have really anxious or neurotic parents, they might have that, those bad genes that, you know, make their dopamine receptors more likely to learn from mistakes but then they also end up paying attention to this more. So it is possible absolutely to have like this bad, you know, mix of genes, but then over time, just train yourself, you know, through like meditation or mindfulness or just um, all these little things you can do. It's like self-affirmation studies, just focus on the good things and let yourself be guided by the rewards instead of just fearful of the potential bad things. So you also talk about Olympic athletes and we usually hold these guys up as like paragons of hard work. That wasn't luck at all, but you highlight research. No, oftentimes luck plays a big role in first that these guys became Olympic athletes. And then second, that they, they, you know, got the gold medal instead of the, the silver medal. Talk about that. So I use Olympic athletes and expertise as sort of this example of, as we were saying before, it's like in order to reach the huge kind of success, you know, whether it's like, you know, for a startup or a musician or something, those like super great heights, it's not 
just a matter of fact of like one thing going right is that absolutely every single thing has to go right. So for Olympic athletes, for example, if you look at them, they happen to be people who fell in love with the sport that they happened to be genetically suited to when they were young enough. And then they got great coaching so that by the time they you know reached their physiological peak like in their early 20s, their skill set was also you know world class. Um, you know, and then along the way, they were just mentally tough and they really believed in their ability to continue getting better. You know, they have no serious setbacks or illnesses or injuries. And then also, you know, when you look at game day, you know, as we were saying before, the later on you go during the day, like the more likely you are to be graded higher, you know, so even on game day, timing can play a huge role. And then on game day also, because you're also dealing with these like, yeah, the effects or the, the difference between like silver and gold medal can just be, you know, such a fraction of a second. So everything on game day also has to go perfectly as well. So like absolutely every single thing, I think of it as like this race and there are all these different hurdles. So it's like, you have to clear every single hurdle and not all of them are entirely up to you. No, right. So but like, what can we take away from these guys? Like this average Joes, right? Who want to tap into that same thing, that sort of luck thread that these guys tapped into. What can we learn from them? Well, I think part of it is honestly, like just hanging out with more positive people. As I was actually just listening to the, this interview I did with the sociologist who studied coaching and athletes at all different levels. And he said that so much of it comes out of these group settings, right? Like people, they don't just kind of magically think like, oh, I'm going to be an Olympic athlete. It's that they hang out with other people who are really positive and just inspire them to work harder instead of, you know, these Olympic athletes, you know, most likely their best friends are not the guys who are saying like, oh God, you're going to the gym. Come on, just, you know, come over, let's play a game. So one of it is group settings and just making sure you, you know, hang out with people that you admire and want to be like. And then also just this steadfast belief in your ability to just get better, just get a little bit better and have the mental resourcefulness to believe that, no, you can do this. Like, you know, whatever is in your control, you can kind of make that happen. You know, I have this poster on my wall, my office I'm looking at right now, it says, you can have results or excuses, but not both. (laughs) And that is entirely true. I think the more excuses you make, like, oh, I can't do this, the more you just set yourself up for failure or for just not getting better. And I always think like, you know what, however hard I think I have it, there's someone out there who has had it even harder and they've gone even further than me. No, for sure. And I think another takeaway I got from it as well is like, find the thing that suits yes. you, right? Exactly. That was one of the things, I'm glad you brought that up. That's pretty much the whole point of the chapter. Olympic athletes are also, they just have had the luck of finding something that they genuinely love. So I think when you find something that you genuinely love and then you focus on how good it feels to get better, I think people often mistake you know, their insane dedications like, oh, how can they do that to themselves 10 hours a day? But actually, you know, in talking to them, they, it does not feel like work to them at all. And that is so important because it, number one, it decreases people's likelihood of burning out because they just genuinely love it. And then, you know, I have a story in there about like Tony Hawk, I mean, you know, after he and like his friend won some, you know, major skateboarding competition, you know, they celebrated for a little bit, but then like, you know, a half an hour later, they were out in the back practicing new moves because they just, they loved it so much. That is something that they would have done in their free time anyways, because they loved it so much. And then when you look at just the cumulative effect of all that practice, that adds up so much. No, it does. And I think this opens up the idea, I think we have in America with this idea, like never quit. You keep going and you, even if it's it's hard, but like my, the, the best thing to do might be quit what you're doing because it's just not suited for you and find that thing that is suited for you. Yeah, I think that's one of the really tricky things because, you know, I'm studying like all these little the impact of say like good coaching or, you know, how much people improve over time. You know, people can be late bloomers, you know, maybe I don't know, find their groove, you know, later on. However, you don't really know that. So there's no, it's really tricky because there's no like good rule of thumb for like, should you keep doing this thing? Are you going to get really good or should you just quit? But I think a lot of it does just have to do with like, what do you really love? I guess it depends, you know, what do you really love? What doesn't feel like work? And then also like, what do you maybe realistically have a better chance of succeeding in? 
So those are kind of a tricky, tricky fields to negotiate, but I think it's, you know, somewhere between those two. Right. No. Yeah. That, that takes some practical wisdom to figure out. Mm-hmm. So another thing too, that can increase our luck is just simply thinking that luck is on our side. Did you find any research that talked about that idea? Yeah. So there's a lot of awesome research in like you know, performance psychology, you know, people who, you know, they have positive expectations or, you know, enhanced expectancies about the future. They end up just doing better, like across the board. There's, you know, one study, people who had some sort of superstitious token when they took a test, they actually ended up performing better because they were less anxious, they were more confident. So people who or even people who are religious and pray, and then they believe like God is on their side. They also have more confidence and they're able to muster more energy. And, you know, they're, they genuinely believe that they can do the thing. So they're actually more likely to go out and do the thing. And I think that people don't realize how it's one of those things that's it's very simple. It's not easy, but it's very simple. Yeah. I've got my lucky tokens that I've got, my lucky pair of socks. Yeah. And I know there are some coaches who think like, oh, that's stupid. You should be able to, you know, do that all on your own. But I feel like that's ridiculous because if it helps you, why not? <laughs> you know, why not use that? No, for sure. Yeah. We had an author on a few weeks ago talking about sports recovery and all these gizmos that have come out in the last few years, like cryotherapy and massage rollers. And basically the research says it doesn't really do much, but like people think it does. And it so that as, as a result, it helps them. It's like the placebo effect. And like she was saying, that's fine. Like that's okay if, the, yeah. if if going if sitting in a cryo spa, you know, makes you feel good and helps you recover. Like makes you feel like you're recovering and helps you perform better. Do it. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Like Tor Regular, he had this awesome thing on like expectancies, and we were talking about this for a very long time. It's like you know what? Like those are real effects. So why would you deny yourself the benefit of those effects? It makes yeah. So if you think you're being really logical, like no, it's it's very you know stupid. I'm too you know scientifically minded to, you know, bring that little rabbit's foot or that little thing that won't help me. But if it it would help you, it's actually like more illogical to not make use of that. Right. So what do you, what is all this, you mentioned it earlier, but how's all this research about, you know, increasing our luck, which is basically trying to, you know, take into account these human factors that often sway whether something happens to us or not and influencing them. But like, how's this research influenced you when things don't go your way, when you're unlucky? This sounds so cheesy. And it's one of those things that I've seen so many times, like, you know, cliche posters or like what your grandmother would say, but it actually ends up having really, you know, scientifically valid background is, you know, use failure as a learning experience. (laughs) And that is it. And I think I used to think of, you know, any kind of failure or setback as just this overall, you know, marker of my worth or my overall ability. But I think if you can kind of remove yourself and look at the situation objectively and look at your part in things and just kind of use that as information to just keep going forward or learn and maybe change your strategy or routine a little bit and go on. Like that is the most beneficial, most beneficial reaction to have. Even if that whole like learning strategy is just, you know what, I'm going to persist. I'm going to you know do this one more time because it really is, you know, how many times are you going to get up? Right. They say like, what a master is somebody who is, failed more times than the novice has even tried. Right. And also just don't take it personally. It's like, well, you know, had nothing to do with me. The guy saw me and reminded me that I reminded him of his crazy uncle. That's why I didn't get the job. Absolutely. Like, yeah, it had nothing to do with me, but also like, however, I can like maximize my desirability as a candidate, you know, however, what this guy says, that doesn't mean I'm bad. Right. So is that, that luck paradox. So you're like, you know, believing in luck can un- unmotivate you really the, the, the upside of not believing in luck is it motivates you, right? right? Cause the, you, you have, you have, you have a sense of control, but the upside of also like also understanding that luck plays a role is like when things don't go your way, you can be like, okay, I did everything I could. This is a learning point. I'm going to keep moving forward despite that. One, yes, absolutely. It is. It's that luck paradox, right? So it's like, it doesn't have anything to do with you because it might've been the shirt you were wearing. However, right. What do you bring to the table? You can learn and be persistent and keep going. Well, Carla, Carla, it's been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? Thank you so much for having me. They can go to my website. It's kstar.com. It's K-S-T-A-R-R.com. Awesome. Well, Carla Starr, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great.
My guest today was Carla Starr. She is the author of the book, Can You Learn to Be Lucky? It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can find more information about her work and the book at her website, KSTAR. That's star with two R's. It's KSTAR.com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash lucky. You can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into the topic.